Lord, just like the choir sang, alive, alive, my Jesus is alive. You're as alive today as you were last Sunday. God, we pray that we'll, uh, we'll do our best to worship you and praise you and exalt you and deliver your word as best we know how. Thank you for the privilege to be able to be here. Thank you for the health that you've allowed us to enjoy. And I just pray that everything said and done will be pleasing to you in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Come in, gentlemen. I'm always encouraged to see y'all here. Always, always encouraged. Anybody here today for the very first time anywhere in the building? That anybody I miss? Sometimes they sneak in. All right, guys, I didn't see a single hand. Okay, Thank you so much. I'm getting ready for a new day, don't it? I'm getting ready for a new day, don't it? Stand with us. We continue to sing this morning. Heaven came down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away. Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy and tell He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul.
Lisa, put that uh, chorus back up there, if you will, for just a minute. That one, can you do that real quick? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off guard. See that, uh, that third line there, my sins were washed away, my night was turned to day. Y'all just stand there like nothing happened. <laughs> my sins were washed away, every one of them. All them boogers! Every one of y'all boogers. I'm the biggest booger here, but all of my sins were washed away. My night turned to day. Oh, well, it's just something special. <laughs> and some of y'all go to a ballpark and look, act like a bona fide idiot, screaming for that grandchild, screaming for that child. Hit that ball! Then you talk about my sins were washed away. I don't know. Sometimes it just blows my mind sometimes. I remember Sue Ann and I were in Brother Larry Brown's church for a number of months. There was uh, two people in that church, and when they would sing something like that, when they'd say, my sins were washed away, and he had a big sanctuary here, they'd go whoosh, running all the way around that thing, you know. And there was a little precious black lady that, that was in the very front row. She'd sit right in front of Larry. And she'd get happy. And this is, she wouldn't run. She's too old to run like me. She's like, woo, 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 woo. She had time. I wish we had some woo around here. You know, it would be good. All right, what are we singing? Isn't he wonderful? Well, that ought to go right along with what we're singing. Isn't he wonderful? Amen. Here we go. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? I said, sing his word, it's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Sing it again. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? I said, sing his word, it's recorded in God's word. bless his name all my soul that is within me you don't have time to warm up on this one you hit it running ready here we go bless, bless the Lord oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name now do that again
How many of us have ever heard somebody say, there's a right way, and there's a wrong way, and there's my way? You ever heard that? Yeah, I think I've been quoted that a time or two. Did you know the Bible teaches that? The Bible teaches that in the eyes of the world, there's a, there's a wrong way to go to heaven. You can't go there because you've been baptized. You can't go there because uh, you joined a church role. You can't go there because your granny was a Christian and she prayed for you all the time. That won't get you there. The Bible teaches that there's only one way. And that's to come before the foot of, Cal of the cross at Calvary. In the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who died for you. And paid the price for you. There's nothing you can do. That's what this song talks about this morning. There's only one way. You listen.
Stand with us. We continue to sing. We'll let our choir go down and our ushers get ready to take today's offering. Rescue the perishing. You know, that's our job is to go out and look for them. Bring them to Christ and he'll rescue them eternally. You sing it with us this morning. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. will say sing the last rescue the perishing duty demands it strength for your labor the Lord will provide back to the narrow way patiently win them tell the poor wanderer a savior has died rescue the perishing care for the dying Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Morning, guys. How y'all doing? Doing well, Mercer? Had a good week? <laughs> All right. Y'all ready to pray? You sure? Yeah, let's pray. Father... Lord, we thank you for the privilege that you give us to, to give. In all honesty, I'm sure there's folk in this room that uh, this is their participation in this church, is their willingness to support it financially for that. We're grateful. And I just pray that you will uh, bless them because of their faithfulness. You give us discernment as we uh, use your money for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Mercer, let me borrow your basket. slow down long enough to thank you for meeting these. Thank you for the faithfulness of our people in Christ's name. Amen. I think it's pretty obvious by the fact that there's not as many seats in the choirs as are out here that most people think that they can't sing. And unfortunately for a few of you, that's probably true. <laughs> but do you know that God wants to hear you sing? He does. I say this all the time, you know, once, uh, once it leaves your mouth and gets to the ear of God, if you're singing for Him, it's in perfect pitch and perfect harmony. And it brings a, a delight and a smile to His face. 
is he wants to hear you sing, not physically sing, but just sing through the life that you live. Sing through your adoration for him. Sing in a way that you honor and you glorify our Lord and Savior. David's going to come and sing a song this morning that says, God wants to hear you sing. And don't think about this as just you physically or literally singing, but the life that you live sings a song to God. You listen. Their chains were fastened tight Down at the jail that night Still Paul and Silas would not be dismayed They said, it's time we lift our voice Sing praises to the Lord Let's prove we will trust Him Come what may God wants to hear you sing When the waves are pressing round you When the fiery darts surround you When despair is all you see God wants to hear your voice When the wisest man has spoken And says your circumstances as hopeless as can be that's when God wants to hear you sing. He loves to hear our praise on our cheerful days when the pleasant times outweigh the bad by far. But when suffering comes along, we still sing him songs. That is when we bless the Father's heart. God wants to hear you sing when the waves are crashing round you, when the fiery darts surround you, when despair is all. Sing. God wants to hear your voice when the wisest man has spoken and says your circumstance is as hopeless as can be. That's when God wants to hear you sing. God wants to hear you sing when the way around you when despair is all you see God wants to hear your voice when the wisest man has spoken and says your son mm -hmm. thank you God yes that's when God Yes! You don't sit down, I'm not going to have a pulpit, sure in the world. Good job. Thank you so much. Amen. That's exactly how we want people to sing from the heart. Take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Psalms. Open up the Word of God to the book of Psalms. Psalm 51. And then I want you to put your finger there. Keep your finger there. We'll get back to that in just a minute. <clears throat> Psalm 51. 
I, uh, I want to begin this morning uh, just a little three or four message series from Psalm 51. <clears throat> and there's a reason I've got for doing this. Uh, well, the main reason is it's what I feel like just God would have me to do, but there are some other reasons. I want to talk to you in this series of messages about the road home to God. I think in this series that you're going to find out, I hope that you'll find out that um, God has a heart to use each and every one of us uh, without a doubt. But sometimes in our lives, because of what we permit to go on in our lives, God can't use us. Things that we don't correct, things that we don't take care of and such as that. And I think this is one of the things that we'll learn in this psalm as we work our way through it. But I want to go back to uh, John chapter 13 for just a minute, just kind of to lay the foundation of, uh, of the message of why, I think basically why. And the main, main, one of the main characters in John 13, most of y'all know that John chapter 13 through chapter 19 and 20 actually take place within a matter of a few hours. Uh, it seemed it may be a long portion of scripture, but they, it's a short amount of time as far as the hours of the times that it takes place. It all begins in chapter 13 as the Lord Jesus takes his disciples into the upper room. He is there with them. Even uh, Judas is with them at this particular time. He'll leave, leave them shortly, but Christ is teaching them some uh, very important lessons that they need to learn and one of them in particular, I, I'm not saying more than others, but there was something that Peter needed to understand. And I think the same thing that Peter needed to, under, to understand in chapter 13 is something that you and I need to understand today in our lives as Christians. So let me read it, and then I'll, I'll make some application. Then we'll go back to Psalm 51. Verse 1, chapter 13, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from the supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Now, right there is when he really caught the disciples off guard because he was getting ready to wash the feet of the disciples, something that they did not want to take place. It was a, a job for uh, the lowest of slaves, servants to do, and here it is, their master that they had been following now for over three years. Uh, and in just a matter of a few hours, unbeknown to them, Jesus was going to be crucified. They didn't know that at the time, but Christ knew that. And Christ was leaving them an example to follow, okay, as far as the, uh, the humility and the, and the heart that they were to follow. But there were a couple of other lessons that he wanted them to follow also. Verse 5. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Are you getting ready to do what I think you're getting ready to do? It ain't going to happen. Now, that's not in there. That's just my version, okay? Some of y'all looking, I didn't see that. That's just me, okay? I'm just trying to fill in the blanks. Verse 7, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now, there's more to that statement than may what, what you may think. 
what Christ was saying, if I don't wash you spiritually, if you don't get clean spiritually, you don't have any part with me. Okay. He goes on to say in verse 9, And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. If that's true, then don't stop with my feet. If it means me going to heaven and having a relationship with you, don't stop with my feet. You just, you help yourself. I mean, we'll have a shower here. But the verse you need to get is verse 10. And Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save or accept to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, or completely clean, what that means. And ye are clean, but not all. Now let me explain that to you. You need to understand, you know, Peter needed to be forgiven, you know, for his sin after salvation. He's not talking about, per se, for salvation when he gets to verse 10. Okay. Peter knew that he, was a, he had a personal relationship with Christ. He'd been following him all this time. He knew that. Peter was saved. But Peter understood the principle that Christ was trying to teach him. He was trying to point out to him, Peter, after salvation, you're going to need to be forgiven. Not for salvation, but for sin. And Christ was giving him a, an, an illustration, an analogy. You see, in those days, you have to understand, they had what was known as public bathhouses. And oftentimes, unless you were wealthy and didn't, if you had that in your own house, is one thing. But oftentimes, they had these public bathhouses, and they would go to the public bathhouse, and they would bathe in these public bathhouses. And when they left the public bathhouse, they would walk home to their house. And by the time they got home, because they had sandals and they had dusty roads, their feet, their feet got dirty. So they had to wash their feet. The point was, what Christ was trying to show him is, Peter, you've been washed all over. When you go to verse 10, those are two different Greek words. One for wash, W-A-S-H-E-D, and the other one for wash. Okay? That's how we say it in Tennessee. You wash and anyhow. Uh, so he said, you've been washed all over. You, you've been forgiven. Your salvation is secured. But there's going to be times in your life, even as a Christian, as you walk through this thing called life, you're going to get dirty. You're going to need be, to be forgiven. Look what he says, if you'll notice, in verse 38, same chapter. Jesus answered him, Will thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, I, This is Christ talking with Peter, still talking to him. Will thou lay down, my life, lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. In other words, Jesus was telling Peter, said, listen to me, Peter. You're talking big. You're talking about you'd give your life for me. But let me tell you something. Within just a few hours, you're going to deny me three different times. And we know from the story that Peter denied the Lord Jesus three different times, even cursed that he knew him. That was when Peter got his feet dirty and he needed to be cleansed. Here's my point in, in this little series of messages in our lives as Christians. We can be saved and we can know that we know Christ is Savior and be forgiven, be justified. And the list goes on with the things that take place in our lives. But there's going to be times in our lives that we're going to need to be forgiven. We're going to need to be cleansed. Let's go back to Psalm 51. Not any of a better illustration than what you find in the life of King David. King David was guilty of adultery. Y'all remember that he had this affair with Bathsheba. We'll maybe look at it a little bit later on. He had this affair with Bathsheba. Not only did he and she conceive a child, but he also had Bathsheba's husband. His name was Uriah. 
he had him killed. He had him put on the front lines of a battle knowing that he would be killed. So David basically was guilty of adultery. David was guilty of murder. David was guilty of lying. And whatever else goes along with all these things that's incorporated with that particular sin. But David was a believer. David was saved. Are you telling me, preacher, that a person can be truly be saved, born again, in sin? That's exactly what I'm telling you. I'll show you scripture to back that up in just a minute. But you follow along with me as I read Psalm 51. I'm going to give you two or three things to mark as we go through there. And, and I think it's important that you kind of pay attention to them, okay? David says this. Now, David, uh, the, the setting of Psalm 51, David has been confronted by a fellow by the name of Nathan, who is a preacher. He's a prophet. God impressed Nathan to go confront King David with his sin. And he's been confronted with it, okay? There's been about a year lapse between the time of committing adultery and murder until he's been conf confronted with this. Psalm 51, also Psalm 32. If you go back sometime and read that. Verse 1, David says, after being confronted, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. There's three words you're going to find in verse uh, 1 and 2 that talk about sin, okay? The first word is the word transgression. We've all heard of the word, they transgress. That means to cross a line. That means when God draws a line in the sand, so to speak, God says, don't cross that line. Don't do that. And we step over that line. That's called transgression. Okay? Verse 2. David says, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. The word iniquity is a second word that talks about sin. The word iniquity literally means crookedness. When somebody does something crooked. Kind of like our modern day politicians. Crookedness. You say, preacher, you ought not to say that. I know. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities. Cleanse me from my sin. The word sin there is a word which means to miss the mark. In other words, we're all sinners. We've missed the mark that God had set for us to live a life of perfection. None of us are going to do that. None of us. I don't care who we are. So we've missed the mark as far. Uh, now, some people do better than others. Some of y'all are not as big a booger as other boogers. Okay, but you're still booger. But some of you are just not as bad, and I'm not going to call any names. I could point figures, but I'm not. Okay, but let's let's read on verse four. And here's a key to David's success as far as his confession is found in verse four. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. In other words, David recognized, God, I've sinned against you. Not, I, I have done wrong to Bathsheba. I have done wrong to Uriah. But my sin, God, is against you and primarily against you. And if I'm going to be forgiven, I'm going to be forgiven by you. Verse 5. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, that doesn't mean that that conception of a child is sin. That's not what he's saying. What he's simply saying there is it takes two sinners to conceive a child. We're both sinners, okay? The mom and the dad are sinners that conceive a child. Verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my, all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy 
of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. You ever done something so bad you just feel like that God's left you or you've left God? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. That means he's talking about Uriah's blood. O God, Thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Verse 15. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praises. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. But notice verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. The word contrite there, God, you won't despise a crushed heart. My heart was crushed because of what I did against you. Verse 18. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Thou shalt, then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings, with whole burnt offerings, then shall they offer bullocks unto thine altar. Father, for these few minutes that we'll take, Lord, help us to just, first of all, to be honest with you and then honest with ourselves that as we go through this thing called life, our feet get dirty. It's going to happen. But it doesn't have to, they don't have to stay dirty. You offer forgiveness just like you did, David. You offer to us. But we have to come your way, not our way. And I pray that not only this morning, but for the next couple of weeks, Lord, that you'll help all of us recognize what we need to do in our lives. And we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Everybody in this room, in the sound of my voice, fits into one of three categories. doesn't matter who you are. And what I mean by that is simply this. First of all, though, there are those that are not truly born again. There are those that may be in this room or maybe will watch this later that don't, they don't know Christ as Savior. They might be religious and they may have their name on a church roll. And they may be sincere and they may be good people and, and, and all of that. But they are, they are what Scripture calls a natural man means they're not a saved individual. Then there are other groups in this room that are, Paul calls them spiritual believers. Take your Bible, keep your finger there again, and go back to 1 Corinthians, and I'll show you what I mean. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul was writing to the believers at Corinth, and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal, even as the babes in Christ. In other words, I, I, you, you were not spiritual. When I, when I make reference to a spiritual individual, that's, that's a believer. A spiritual person is one who's in right relationship with the Lord. They're the person who has a loving, obedient uh, life for Christ. They love the Word of God. They love the house of God. They love the people of God. They love the God of the Word, and they just do the best they can to love God. So there are those that are known as the natural man, the unbeliever. There is the spiritual individual that loves God. And then there are those that Paul calls carnal. The word carnal is a, literally, it means the word is the word fleshly, meaning that the believer lives his or her life for the things of the flesh. They live according to satisfy their flesh. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to have what I want to have. I don't care what God says. I don't care what the Word of God says. I live my life in such a fashion that I live to please me. It's about me. And I'm going to do whatever it is that I want to do, and I'll just live with the consequences and whatever the consequences may be. I think, it, I think it's important for, for people to understand a carnal believer, 
a person that lives according to the flesh is a person, can they be saved? Sure. They're a carnal believer, but they're living out of character. That's not how a Christian lives. A Christian doesn't live in order to please himself. They live a life in order to please the Lord. So we find in Scripture many individuals who, who took steps in the wrong direction in their lives. You know, they, they were, uh, at the time, they were spiritual, loved God, but there were times in their lives that they got out of sync as far as being with God. Let me give you some illustrations to consider. There was, in the Old Testament, there was Moses. Moses was, the Bible says, God, God called Moses the most humble man in all of Scripture. But there were times in Moses' life that he was disobedient and he suffered the consequences of his disobedience. He wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. Why? Because he did something contrary to God. There were consequences for the choices that he made. There was a time in Moses' life that Moses got his feet dirty and he had asked God to forgive him. Elijah, Elijah was a great prophet for God, but there was a time in Elijah's life that he got along with God and said, God, just take my life. Just do away with me. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of running from Jezebel. I'm tired of all the pressure. I'm tired of it all. Do you realize that there can be times in the life of a Christian that pressures can get so much that that's the best way out? Just take my life. It can happen to any of us. Moses, Elijah, there was Jonah. Jonah refused to go where God sent him. God sent him one direction, and he turned around and went in the other. God said, Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach. Jonah went down, got on the boat, and went the opposite direction to a place called Jaffa. And Peter, we saw the life of Peter three different times. Peter denied the Lord Jesus. John Mark, who traveled with uh, uh, Paul, there was a time that John Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas in the ministry. And maybe one of the greatest examples is a fellow by the name of Demas. Demas was a follower of God, but you find in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Demas had forsaken me, having loved this present world. I, what, I, what I want to do, I, I want to end this little series as best I can is to see what God did in the life of David to bring David back to where God could bless him and use him again. You know, I, I don't know, uh, maybe some of you can relate to King David. And I don't mean that, uh, that you're guilty of adultery, you're guilty of murder, uh, you know, maybe you, you're, you're not there. I pray that you're not anyhow. But maybe either you've fallen into sin of some sort or you're dangerously close to falling in some sort of a sin, what, whatever it may be. And it's my prayer that, that like David, that you'll come to the realization that sin always has consequences. But it's never too late to turn from your sin and turn back to God, no matter what it is that might be going on in your life. There's not a person, I believe, listening to me that doesn't struggle with sin. Again, your struggle may not be the same as David's was. You know, uh, you may not be in the act of adultery. But let me ask you a question. You ever thought about it? Jesus says in Matthew chapter number 5, it's just as bad to do it as it is to think about doing it. According to Scripture, what the Bible has to say. As a matter of fact, your struggle with sin may not be a struggle with the flesh at all. Maybe your struggle with sin is a struggle with what's known as a sin of the spirit. You may not preach. I don't have a problem with, with lust. I don't, I don't have a problem with that kind of stuff. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have a, you have a struggle with unforgiveness without forgiving someone? Do you have a struggle with bitterness? Do you have a struggle with anger? Do you have a struggle with jealousy? You may not be acting out your sin, but it's there nonetheless, whatever it may be. I think what's important to understand about sin is sin is against God first and foremost, no matter what it may be. Sin is like gravity. It'll do nothing but pull you down. But God's made a way for us 
to overcome the sin when we do face it. If you want to know about that, go back to the book of First John. Let me read a verse or two to you. Because there are those that think that they don't struggle with sin. The Bible says, if in the book of 1 John, John is writing to Christians. He's not writing to the unsaved. He's writing to believers. In 1 John chapter number 1, look at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, talking about with God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. In other words, you can't say that you have a relationship with Christ and continue to walk in the darkness of the world and the sin of the world. He goes on to say, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. But here's the kicker. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In other words, if you sit there and you say something like, I'm not a problem. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't need this message. I'm good. I, my mind is straight. I don't think anything that I ought not to think. I, I'm not doing anything. I don't know why I'm here. Scripture says if we say that we have no sin, we're a liar. I didn't say it. God said it. We all struggle with it. The fact is, is what we do with it when we struggle with it. The next verse in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this, If we confess our sins, He, meaning God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think there are three ways that you can deal with your sin. Number one, you can cover your sins up. Number two is you can, con you can confess your sins to God. And then number three is you can conquer your sins. And when I talk about covering your sins, I'm, I'm talking about there's a lot of people that struggle with whatever it may be, and uh, they're not willing to own up that, they, uh, that they're struggling, and then they begin to lie about their sin. Oh, I don't have no problem. I'm good. I don't have no problem, problem with anger. I'm fixing to have a problem with anger if you don't shut up and talk about my sin. I don't have no problem with, with, with that. I'm, I'm good. You know, people have a tendency to cover them up, deceiving other people, and you know, deceiving ourselves sometimes about our sin, lying to God about them. I think lies is typified by the darkness where, where God's truth is light. That's exactly what he was talking about there. There's a, there's a great verse found in the book of Proverbs. You don't have to turn there. It's found in Proverbs chapter 28. In verse 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. When he talks about shall not prosper, he's meaning a life, a man's forfeited his spiritual prosperity and his blessings of God. I don't think he's talking about shall not prosper materially, things he has. I think he's talking spiritually speaking. And in the contrast, a person who confesses his sin will prosper spiritually. You can hide your sins from everybody but God. So you, you can cover your sins or you can confess your sins. Like I said, the word confess means to agree with God about him. You, don't, you know, you don't have to doubt if something you're doing is wrong. The Spirit of God will show you that it's wrong. Sometimes we just don't want to hear what the Spirit of God's got to say. That's called conviction. Conviction in a person's life is nothing more than God shining a light upon your sin and showing you what your sin is. As you walk in darkness of this thing called life, and God comes along and convicts you, shows a light, shines a light on your sin, and encourages you to repent and confess your sin and turn from it and turn back to Him. I'm talking about believers. I'm not talking about the unsaved. There's not but one sin or sin anybody to hell. That's the sin of unbelief. But there's a lot of sins that will cause your life and my life to become ineffective for God and a testimony before other people if we're not willing to confess whatever it may be. God says to turn from it. I personally believe that there are believers in heaven today because of their unwillingness to confess 
and turn from their sin. The Bible talks about that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in the context of the Lord's Supper. If a person doesn't get things right before God before they partake of the Lord's Supper, God said many people sleep. It means they died. Graveyard dead. God took them out because they were unwilling to confess their sins and turn from their sins. I think confession of sin will bring release from the control of your sin and freedom from your sin and forgiveness and a new beginning in a person's life. So we can cover our sins or we confess our sins. And third thing, we can conquer our sins. The Bible talks about that Christ is in heaven today as our advocate, as a a spokesman on our behalf. He goes before the Father and says, They belong to me, Father. When we confess our sins, God's there to help protect us from what we go through. And in order to conquer any and all sins in your life, the Bible talks about we have to learn to abide in Christ, to obey Christ, what Christ says, to love Christ supremely, and walk in the light of Christ. And to love Him, to serve Him, and obey Him in His Word. Let me ask you a question real quick. Are you covering your sin or are you conquering your sin? You're doing one or the other. If you've got sin in your life, you're either covering it or conquering it. My advice is to confess it, any known sin, and ask God to cleanse your heart. Whether it's a sin of commission or a sin of omission, whatever it may be. He wants to forgive you so that he can restore you into fellowship with him. Many of us know the story. There's a story given in Luke chapter 15. It's called the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son is a young son decided that he wanted to go out and enjoy wine, women, in the world. He went to his father and he said, Father, he said, I want my inheritance now. Now, basically, back in those days, if a child went to the father and said, I want my inheritance now, if a son went to the father, I want my inheritance now, the son was saying to the father, I don't care if you're dead or not, I want my money. I want my inheritance. And sure enough, the father gave him what he wanted. And the Bible talks about how the son went out into the world and he enjoyed what the world had to offer for a while. He partied. He partied big time. He had his wine, and he had his women. He had everything that went along with that. And before long, his money ran out. When his money ran out, all of his friends left. that sound familiar? When all of his friends left, he didn't have anybody else to turn to. He'd run out of money. He said, well, the only thing I know to do is get me a job. He went to work for a pig farmer. The pig farmer put him out in the pigsty. His job for a Jewish young boy to go out in the pigsty and take care of his pigs wasn't a real good thing. And finally, there came a time in the life of this young boy's life, in his mind, he said, I'm going home to my father. I'll be glad to go back and serve him as a servant, but I'm going back home to my father. And he headed home, and the Bible talks about as he got close to home, He wasn't fearful so much. He didn't know what his father was going to do. But what he saw as he got close to home was the father standing out looking for him to come home, looking for him to come back. And that's exactly what God does in your life and my life as one of his children. That when we get sin in our life, our father stands there and he looks out the window. Hey, come on home. He runs to us and he puts his arms around us and he loves us and he kisses us. Put a new coat on him. Put a ring on his finger. He belongs to me. Don't worry about his sin. He's mine. Ain't nobody like him. Love him. That's the way God received you and God received me. Jesus tells us that chapter there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. I'm telling you what, guys, I've kept God busy shouting in glory. Every time I come back to him, there's shouting going on in heaven. I know that none of y'all do that, and I'm glad about that. I'm good to be around a bunch of saints. But I've about wore God out, going to my Father, my Heavenly Father, 
as he stands and he looks out there. There he comes again. Come on, Mickey. Hurry up. I'm coming. And he receives me. Do you know something? He's never turned me down. He's never been so bad. He's never looked at me and said, that's pretty bad. This time's pretty bad. He's never done that. Every blessed time. Come on home. Come on. Hey, get him a coat. Put a new coat on. I got so many rings you can't imagine. Put a ring on his finger. Ain't no telling how many rings I got in heaven. It's amazing. Listen, in, in, as, as we learn in Psalm 51, there's going to be some necessary steps to take in order to come back home. And there's some things we're going to learn the results of taking those steps. We're going, we're going to work our way through Psalm 51, verse by verse, sometimes even word by word. I want to show you two things in closing, two ways that God will reveal your sin to you as we work our way through here. Number one, your sin will be revealed through the conviction of the Spirit of God. The Bible says, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. When those who are truly saved, born again, fall into sin, the Spirit of God will convict them no matter what it may be, if you're truly a born-again believer. And when a believer is convicted of sin, they become aware of how their sin dishonors the Lord. And if you're not, listen carefully what I'm getting ready to say, if you're not convicted of your sin, then there's good evidence that you're not truly a born-again believer. I'm not trying to judge you, I promise you. I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip, I promise you. I'm trying to show you what the Word of God says. Go with me to the book of Hebrews for just a minute. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me show you two verses, three verses. If you think that you are saved and you can sin all you want and live however you like, then you're sadly mistaken of what the Word of God has to say. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. In other words, those that God love, when they get sideways with God, the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now watch this. And if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, in other words, if, if nothing takes place in your life, if there is no conviction about your sin, if sin does not bother you in the least, if there be no chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof are are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Point being is, if God doesn't deal with you in your sin, then you're not one of him. I didn't write it, God wrote it, and I think he wants us to understand it. Either God's word is true or it's not. Let me, let me give you one, one, one more verse. I want you to, and I want everybody, if you don't mind, turn to this and I'll wrap it up. Go to uh, second, uh, second Corinthians chapter 13. You're either a child of God or you're not. There is no in between. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Paul said this, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in ye, except ye be reprobates. 
That word reprobates there in the context means an unbeliever. Now let me read it again. 2 Corinthians 13, 10. Examine yourselves. Now why in the world would he tell believers, or why would he tell anybody to examine themselves about anything? Because he wants you and I to know that we know we know. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. We'd stop right there. Examine yourself. Test yourself. See whether or not you know that you know Christ is Savior. Whether or not there's been a change in your life. Plain and simple. That you're really a child of God. He wouldn't have put that in there if there wasn't a possibility of people not knowing if they were saved. He'd have never put it in Scripture. Not only will your sins be revealed through the Spirit of God by conviction, number two, I'm through. Your sin will be revealed through the truth of God's Word. The Bible says, and going along with, with Psalm 51, it talks about it in uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing the sunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. David said in Psalm 51, verse 3, For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. You see, the Word of God, the Bible says, discerns our intents, thoughts, and hearts. One of the things that we're going to learn from Psalm 51 is that David was willing to take the responsibility for his sin. After David was confronted by the preacher, by Nathan, the prophet, about his sin, the Bible says that David turned from his sin and turned back to God. I want you to get two things. Number one, as we go through this thing called life, our feet get dirty. Some of, some of our feet are dirtier than others, and I understand that. I really do. Some of us struggle with, with sins of the spirit, sins of the flesh. All of our struggles are different, but struggles we have nonetheless. So, as you go through this thing called life, your feet get dirty. As a Christian, when your feet get dirty, God says, I want you to look down and I want you to see your feet. See how nasty they are? Yes, Lord, clean them up. But they're going to get dirty again. I don't care. Clean them up. But, Lord, clean them up. You know what God says during the invitation time? Clean them up. Look at your feet. Clean them up. I can't use somebody with dirty feet. What did Peter do just a matter of hours after Christ told him what was going to take place? He denied him three times, even cursed him. I don't know this Christ. Who is he? And then the cock crowed. And Jesus turned, in the book of Luke, turned and looked at Peter. The Bible says Peter left, run out, weeping and crying. You know what we need to do it in our churches, guys? We need to sometimes get up from our blue seats and run to the altar of God weeping and crying because we're just like Peter. Problem is, we won't own up to it. Oh, I'm not as bad as Peter. Yes, you are. Oh, I haven't done what Peter has. Yes, you have. We all have. It's imperative in our lives, guys, that we get our feet clean. Keep them clean. No matter how, how dirty they get. I'll close with this. Sue Ann and Brad have a, uh, they have a good time. There is about every two weeks, two or three weeks, Sue Ann will take Brad to get his toes done. <laughs> T 
toes done. It's a treat for Brad. He never had to have his toes done. First time they came back from getting his toes done, I said, Brad, I said, have you ever known a truck driver get his toes done? But he, he didn't care. Yeah, I, he, my toes, I, toes. He wanted to pull his shoes off and show, I don't care about seeing your toes. Okay? <laughs> but his feet hadn't been the same since, honestly. She was having to take him to one of these feet doctors, and they were cutting nails and cutting all that stuff. And she said, I'll just take him and get his toes done. Now he's a truck driver that gets his toes done, but he's got clean feet. But every now and then, she'll take him back to get his feet cleaned up again. Why? They got dirty. And there's some of us in this room got dirty feet. Father, thank you for David's life. Not the part where he committed adultery, not the part where he murdered but thank you, Lord, for his willingness to confess, clean up, and be used by you in a great and mighty way. And Father, there's not a one of us in this room this morning that there's not times that our feet get dirty. And I'm not here to judge anybody. I have enough problems taking care of my own feet, my own mind, my own thoughts. But Lord, I do pray if we're going to be effective as a church, if there's going to be people in this room that's going to be effective as a mom or a dad or a friend or whatever it may be, we, we, we got to be clean. And if it means coming to you every day of our life, then so be it. And before long, we'd get tired of coming, we'd start cleaning up and staying clean. But God, we got to start somewhere. So I pray this morning, Lord, first of all, that people will examine themselves, as the Bible says, to know that they're in the faith, that they know Christ is Savior, not religious, not sincere, but they have been born again by the Spirit of God, been saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and no other way. They're not dependent upon anything or anybody else other than you and you alone. And then I pray for believers here this morning, truly believers. God, that they'll examine their hearts and look at their feet, so to speak, and see where they stand in their relationship with you. God, clean feet's an important thing in our lives and in our day and time. Help us to make a difference in the lives of others. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Let's stand up, would you please?